this is what digging deeper will do. Okay? This is what dig digging deeper does. It takes you out of your routine. As the Spirit spoke the words about why sit you here till you die, I fear in my heart that there are some who are just waiting to die. Well, you, you may not call it waiting to die. You're just sitting and waiting until Jesus comes. I get it. I'm excited about that too. But the thing is, Jesus didn't leave us with a word to say wait. He left us with a word that said work. And if you're just waiting, you're dying. If you've reached a point in your life where your age is too old, your body's too frail, your spirit's too unwilling, you're too burnt out, you're dying. And you need a regeneration. Didn't the Holy Ghost speak that word? You need to regenerate in the Holy Ghost. This church needs some more Caleb's who will say, I may be old, but I'm just as strong as I once was. I want the mountain. This church needs some people who will step up and then where the word of Joel says that old men will dream dreams and young men shall see visions. They are the same thing. A vision is what is ahead. A dream is just something you've always carried. It just hasn't been met yet. So when you're young, you have visions of what is ahead. But when you're old, you're saying, hey, I had a vision that's still starting. It's starting to look like it's a dream because it hasn't happened, but I've been carrying it a long time. God wants you to testify still of the visions and the dreams. The Holy Ghost is still working. The Holy Ghost is still speaking. And we need to dig deeper. John chapter 15, beginning at verse 1, Jesus speaks these words. He said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, in verse 4, he says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless, everybody say unless, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. Not some fruit. A little fruit. The Father's not glorified in your little fruit. Oh, God, just help me do a little better. God says, I ain't answering that prayer. Your little fruit doesn't do anything for the glory of God. Well, just as long as I bear more than somebody else. Doesn't do anything for the glory of God. He said, this is where my Father's glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love, which literally means do not, do not doubt my love for you. Jesus gives us the principle about roots and fruits. But before I read from Matthew chapter 7, I want to, I feel like the Holy Ghost has been confronting through these words in preparation, confronting me first, but, but I think that we've got to say, all right, Holy Ghost, if you're going to speak to me, don't speak to me the things that I just want to hear. Speak to me what I need to hear. See, some of you, the reason you miss God is because you only want him to speak what you want. You need to speak. 
Do you think it's comfortable standing down there saying, Holy Ghost, what do you want to tell? What do you want to speak into this congregation? Holy Ghost, let the gifts flow in this place. And the word that the Holy Ghost gives me repeatedly is, you missed me. And, he was, and it wasn't a word that I felt like was for me. It was like God was saying, I need, I want somebody to know. Because they're asking, are we going to miss God? Am I missing God? Am I prepared for God? Oh, God's given me something. And God wanted you to know you really did miss him. There's something that he was going to do in you, something he invited you into, or something he would have done in you, but you walked in with no desire to be used, and you missed him. And if you think it's uncomfortable to be used by God, it's more uncomfortable to know you missed him. I would rather go out on a limb with God than to leave this place without him. You're going to dig deeper. You're going to have to trust him. So here's the confrontational question. I want to ask you about your root causes. Your root causes. What's the root cause of what you are producing in your life? What's the root cause of what is happening or not happening in your life? See, everything's got a root. Jesus gives us the principle that whatever is the fruit in your life is because of the root in your life. No fruit, bad fruit, bad root. So what, what's the root cause of the blessings of God? Or what's the root cause of not walking in the favor of God? What's the root cause of the habitual sin that's in your life? You've been praying for some time. I don't know. You've got something in your life. You're saying, God, I want to move this out of my life. I know you're not happy with this in my life. But what is it that keeps taking you back into it? There's a root. It's not just the sin. It's not just the habit. But something is at the root that makes you keep turning back to it. What's the root cause of bondage? What's the root cause of unhealthy relationships? Are you still dating losers? Why? Why is it that you're only attracting those who don't want anything to do with God? What's the root cause of financial success? What's the root cause of your financial struggle? What's the root cause of your health? The root cause of your foolish behavior? Holy Ghost, speak to us right now. What's the root cause of your divided home? What's the root cause of divided churches? What's at the root of your marital infighting? Everything starts with a root. And how you nurture or how that root starts flowing in your life has everything to do with why you are still where you are. Why you're still battling the fight you're battling. Why you haven't overcome. You're shallow. You need to start dealing with your roots. Jesus gives us the principle about roots and fruits. Let's look at Matthew chapter 7. Every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. The context is about ministry. The context actually was about those who come declaring the word of God or those who come declaring they are Christians, followers of Christ. The context actually was beware of ravenous wolves. Beware of those who come in. You don't have to know all the details of their life. Look at the fruit 
and you'll know their root. Now, this is Jesus. So whatever it is you wish to produce out there for everybody else to see, listen, you're never going to produce what God wants in your life if something is wrong with your root system. In Matthew 12, 33, the word says, either make the tree or make the root good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. So what is the condition of your root system? Are you so busy trying to produce the right fruit all the while that your root is struggling? You need to dig deeper. If you're going to address the root, the fruit in your life, you got to start at the root. Let me give you these word, quick points. Number one, John chapter 15 tells us Jesus is the root. Jesus is the root. The root is not your goals. The root is not your vision. The root is not your dreams or your plan. Jesus is on the throne. Jesus wants to be in your heart. But Jesus has to also be the root to everything in your life. He's prophetically called the root in Isaiah chapter 11, called him himself the root of Jesse. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, he is called the root of David. In Revelation 22, verse 16, he says, I am the root and the offspring of David. What's that mean? It means I was before him and I'm after him. It means I'm the first and the last. I'm the beginning and the end. I'm the alpha and the omega. The root is everything. Jesus claims the root. If you don't get anything out of these few minutes together, get this. If the fruit that is coming from your life is doing anything other than bringing glory and honor to the Father, then your life is rooted in something other than Jesus Christ. If your work isn't bringing glory to God, then Jesus isn't at the root of your work. If your marriage relationship is not something that is edifying between the two of you, you're not helping that person to become what God has called them to be. If there is nothing that's bringing God glory in your marriage relationship, your marriage has a different root than Jesus. Your parenting, grandparenting, your future, your investments, if it's aimed to do anything, then bring glory to God. The root is not Jesus. Jesus also claims to be the true vine. He's the true vine. Again, Isaiah prophesies, For he shall grow up before him, he being Jesus, grow up before the Father as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. Claiming to be the true vine, there's uh, uh, looking at the terminology the Strong's Concordance says the true vine means opposite to what is fictitious, opposite than what is counterfeit, imaginary, simulated, or pretend. When he calls himself the true vine, Jesus is saying, I'm the real vine. Everything else you think is going to produce the fruit in your life, whether it be your job, your family, your happiness, your entertainment, your hobbies, whatever it is you keep pursuing, Jesus says, no, 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 your true vine is me. You know what happens to people? Like, let, let's just say, let, let's just say, if I just had more money, I'd be happier. No, you won't. You know what more money will do? It'll make you more of the person you already are. In other words, if you want more money because you're greedy, you're just going to be more greedy. If you need more money because you're living in fear, guess what? You're just going to live in more fear. If... <laughs> If you're already a jerk, you're just going to be a bigger jerk. You know why? Because none of those vines will change who you are. They're all rooted in something other than Jesus. But when Jesus is the root, then Jesus becomes the one who actually orchestrates everything else going on in your life. Your dating relationship, changing your spouse, if my kids would just behave... Those aren't the vine. Oh, my goodness, if we just had better weather, if we could all just, you, you hear what I'm saying? We all testify and have prayer requests. If God would just do this for me, do that for me, open that door, then I'd be 
a good Christian. You better dig deeper. The true vine is only Jesus. Literally, when he calls himself the true vine, what he is saying is, I am the fruit-producing vine. It also has a picture, I am not a jungle vine. You go out there in the woods, you got some vines that produce fruit, you got some vines that are growing all over the place, they don't produce anything. Jesus said, I am a fruit, the fruit producing vine in your life. This is why it was important for us to abide in him. Look at again in John 15, third point, real quick. We are the branches. John 15, 4 through 5, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. God, I don't understand why I'm not producing, why more fruit's not being, being shown in my life. I don't understand why I don't feel like I'm doing anything for the glory of God. I'm going to ask you, are you abiding in the vine? Those who abide in the vine produce. Jesus calls himself the fruit-producing vine. As the branches, all right, I understand this. Without him, we can do nothing, right? Without him, we can do nothing. Everybody say amen. You believe that's the word of God? Without Jesus, we can do nothing, John 15, 5, right? Okay, how about this one? Do you believe it? Philippians 4, 13. Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ. So without him... I can do nothing, but through him, I can do everything. Which life do you want? You want to abide? You want to do everything through Christ? You better dig deeper. Or you want to do it without him and stay shallow. This word abide means literally to stay or to dwell in one place for a long time. It means to reside. The Holy Ghost was speaking so many things into my heart even this morning. But, but, but this abiding is not about complacency and it's not about your comfort zone. This abiding means to be anchored in Jesus Christ. He is the root. But it also has a connotation that you are immovable inseparable. It's one who remains rooted through the struggle. I appreciate Josh's testimony again, that the storms come, the winds blow, but when you are abiding in Christ, you're not going with the wind. You're not going with the flow, but you're abiding. You remain rooted through the struggle. It's persevering through the storm. It's being committed. It's being loyal. It's being faithful. It's not being wish-washy. If your testimony, if your life is wishwashy, if you're here, here's wishwashy. Sometimes I feel like it, sometimes I don't. I don't want to be around that. And God doesn't want to use it. The person who walks in doesn't feel like it today. But then the next time, oh, I feel like it now, and then you expect God to use you. God says, No, I'm not using you. You're not abiding. In and out is not what God called us to be. In fact, I don't even think God called us to be up and down. I think he called us to be consistent. So, Pastor, are you just saying that, that my feelings are real? No, I think your feelings are real. I just think that your real feelings are lying. I think that you put way too much stock in your feelings. And you need to put your stock in the truth. He is faithful. He is abiding. He is trustworthy. God's not calling you to do things because you feel like it. Can I go to one more scripture? <laughs> Told you it'd be only a few. But I'm all, I, I, I know the Holy Ghost is speaking this. James chapter 1, it sounds very familiar if you're talking about wisdom because it's a passage we'll use much. But the principle applies in getting a rooted faith as well. He goes in verse 5. If you're going to ask God, if you're going to pray, if you're going to climb the steps of prayer, you better ask in faith with no doubting. With no doubting, 
For he who doubts, and I'm not talking about questioning God. I'm not talking about, Lord, I don't understand. God, I don't know how you're going to do it. But you know why God doesn't do a lot of things? Because at your root system, you have the prayers of unbelief. You pray one thing, but you believe a different thing. That's at your root system. You know why you know, we know it's at your root system? Because even though you say it, you don't act it. You don't walk in it. It's like, well, I'll walk in it when God does it. No, if you believe God's doing it when you prayed it, start walking in it. The fruit producing vine, which is Jesus, will work the prayers, uh, will answer the prayer in your life. But if you're sitting there just saying, I'm going to pray this, but I don't think God's going to do it, well, then don't worry about it. He won't. God is not looking for your prayers of unbelief. Did I lose my There we go. He who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. The current in, the current out. The current in, the current out. God says there's nothing stable about that. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded, double-minded man unstable in all his ways. Look, look what you produce. A double-minded man, by the way, is another way of calling a person two-faced. They're one way at church, and you're another way when you're with your friends. You're unstable. You know, where, you know how you change that? It's not, it's not by simply just saying, well, Lord, help me to be the same person. Nope, you've got to go to the root. You better dig deeper. Because you're producing a whole different person other, in other places. God says you are unstable in all your ways if you're not abiding in Christ. He goes on to tell us that if we abide in Him and He abides in us, there is a result of bearing much fruit. The natural process of abiding in Christ and He in us is not that we bear some but that we bear much. Since Jesus is the fruit-producing vine, let's bring a little clarity to what it means to bear before I close this up. To bear fruit in the Scriptures of John chapter 15 is not talking about it's your responsibility to produce the fruit. The, the word bear there, to bear much fruit, means literally to carry much fruit. It doesn't mean to produce it. It means to carry it. See, we are fruit, not fruit producers. We are fruit carriers. Come on. Think about Galatians chapter 5. In Galatians chapter 5, it says, the fruit of the Spirit is, say it with me, love. Come on, say it with me. Joy. Peace. Where am I at? Peace. Long-suffering. Kindness. Goodness faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. There's no limit. We don't carry a little bit of love. We carry the love of God. We don't carry a little bit of joy. We carry the joy of God. You see, if we're going to talk about sharing the gospel in our lives, if you're going to be a witness to the world, if you're going to be, a, be an individual that carries the fruit of God, you've got to have the root with the vine coming throughout your life, and it alone will result in these fruits. By the way, when Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly, he was not talking about the good life. He wasn't talking about the happy life. I, I, I think he was talking about a fruit living life. That's the abundant life. People should be able to taste and see that the Lord is good. If your whole point in, 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 in getting Jesus as your root, if, you, if you're just looking to carry the fruit so that everybody sees it in your life, that's not what we're supposed to do. The fruit does no good sitting on the table. Fruit does no good if it stays on the vine. Fruit has to be carried to an individual, and it become a part of another person's life for it to actually nurture them. 
Just having it for people to see is doing no good in this world. Sharing the gospel in our lives means we've got to carry the fruit of Jesus Christ into the world that we're living in. This is why I sent this message out this week in Matthew 5, verse 16, and we're going to be doing this again this week, praying this prayer. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I'm going to ask you again. What is... Who, is, who, who are you working to glorify? Is it you or is it the Father? Your talents, your gifts, even these guys that come on the, the, the platform, it may be Sunday, they may be singing songs about Jesus, but if they're doing it for themselves, there's no glory for the Father. Let your light so shine before men. What is this light? We're talking about the fruit of who Jesus is. Let the light shine before men. Don't hide it. Don't put it out. Don't cover it up. Don't put it off in another room. It's a very dark world, and the role of the church, the work of the church, is to take the light out there. Let the light shine before men so that they may see the light but glorify the Father. So how do we dig deeper? This is where Jesus says in, in John 15, 1, he said, my father is the vine dresser. My father is the vine dresser. King James Version calls him the husbandman. It's another fancy word for saying the father is a farmer. He's a hardworking far, a farmer. In fact, there's only three scriptures uh, in, in the New Testament that refer to the vine dresser. But each of them apply to the Father. So John 15, 1 was 1. 2 Timothy 2, 6, the husbandman or the hardworking farmer that labors must be first partaker of the fruits. Think about this. Everything Jesus is doing in your life, the first one to receive from your life is the Father. What are you giving God? Oh, quit, quit asking God just to use you and start with, hey, God, I just want to bless you. You're the farmer. James 5, 7 tells, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman, or the farmer, waits for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he receives the early and latter rain. My father is the husbandman. Jesus is the root. Jesus is the true vine. We are the branches that carry the fruit. But the Father is the one who helps you to go deeper. How does the Father get you deeper? Three things the Father does. First, He prepares the soil. He's the one that cultivates it. He's the one that toils the, so the soil. Jesus gives a parable about the seed and the sower. That should belong to every one of us every single day, every time we approach the Word of God. See, some of you did nothing to get your spirit ready for church today. You got your body ready, got your hair ready. You got everything else that everybody sees ready, but your heart wasn't ready. Coming into the Word of God through the place of worship and everything else that you do spiritually, the Father is working something with the soil, getting it ready to receive. The reason people leave church or leave their devotions or whatever it is, anytime there's a time with God, when you leave unaffected, it's because your soil was never prepared for the Word. If your faith isn't increased, if your life is not impacted, if the Spirit has not spoken and you still walk away, God's not the one with the problem. So the father starts tilling the soil, starts cultivating things and saying, hey, I want you to receive the word. It's not enough to just throw the seed out and just let it sit in the wayside or in the shallow dirt. Jesus can, he gives us understanding to all these different things. But for the one who is the disciple, the one who wants to produce much fruit, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold, the Lord says, no, nah, there's something different about the soil. The Father knows what he's got to do in your life to get you to go deeper. 
You see, you have to break up some fallow ground to go deeper. That hard soil you got, that hard heart you got, that routine you're stuck in, that rut you're in, God will do some things. Get ready. God's going to do some things, and he's going to mess up that soil. And it's going to hurt. But please hear verse 9. Just abide in my love. Don't doubt my love for you. This may hurt. This may sting. This is going to get uncomfortable. But I want you to know, I'm doing this because I love you. And I want you deeper. Second thing God does as the farmer, as the vine dresser, is he purges the branches. Every branch that does not carry fruit, he takes away. It might be a dead branch. It might be a rebellious branch. But either way, according to Ezekiel chapter 15, any branch that does not have fruit on the vine is a worthless branch. What's God doing in this day and age? He's purging. So, Pastor, isn't he pruning? No, that's next. Don't rush it. If it's dead, he removes it. If you're not willing for God to use you, you're not willing for the fruit, you don't want to stand out, God, I just want to fit in with everybody. Guess what? You're not going to make it. I'm sorry, I don't, I'm, I'm not trying to be the negative nilly in the room. I'm, all to, I'm, I'm shooting straight with you as your pastor. Just sitting there and waiting until Jesus comes. You're dying. He called you to produce fruit. Carry the fruit that Christ is producing in your heart. The third thing the farmer does as the vine dresser is he prunes. He prunes the tree. Every branch that bears or carries fruit, he says he prunes it that it might bring forth more fruit. So when I was a young man before I was married, I used to have a couple of seasons that I worked for an apple orchard. One of the seasons was for picking, and the other season was in the springtime getting the trees ready for the next growth. And one of the teams I served on was the pruning team. And I'm going, how do you know which branches need to be pruned and which ones don't? So let me give you, I don't know everything about this, but let me tell you what I learned. When it comes to pruning the tree, and this is all applicable to your spiritual life, when it comes to pruning a fruit tree, these are the things they're looking for. Number one, obviously, if, it, if it's a tree or a branch that is not producing, you have to actually pull that out anyway. But in the pruning process, when there's a tree with a, a bunch of, uh, of, of something unhealthy about it, it's diseased. It's not necessarily dead, but you have to pull it out because what is diseased, you've got good nourishment trying to get to it, but it won't let it come through. So it's taking away from the other branches that need the good nourishment so you're going to have to take off anything that is diseased. It's going to die eventually, so just take it out. Don't invest in it. Another thing about pruning is that if the branches are growing too close together, when the wind blows, the branches will knock against each other, and they will end up causing damage to each other. So you've got to thin it out. When day, windy days were happening... It just causes more problems. One does damage to another, so take one out. There's another pruning for the purpose of the light. You see, in order for something to grow healthy, it's got to have light to it. I said, if it's too thick of branches, then the light doesn't get all the way down into the tree where the fruit is. So you have to thin it out so the light gets through. Now, I, I haven't got time to talk, break all those different.
town. I don't know why it keeps going in and out. I'm sorry. But I, I thought about this, that our lives become so busy that God says, there's much fruit that you could bear, but your life has gotten too busy. I'm going to have to thin it out. Jesus, in his parable about the sower, he talks about the seed growing up and it has a healthy, healthy beginning to it. it, it, it everything to, to what, what he planted, it's growing just like it said, but then it said, talks about thorns that grew up around it and it choked out the plant. There was nothing wrong with the plant. The problem was the thorns of the earth were all around it to where the plant could no longer grow because of everything else that was going on with it, around it. So I'm going to ask you, what pruning does God need to do so that you will bear much fruit? I'm reminded one other principle from Jesus. He tells us that if you're not going to be faithful with the little things, then you can't be faithful in the much. So a prayer that says, God, I want you to do more in my life. I want you to be seen more in my life. I want the light to shine more in my life. But God, do not prune. Leave my li I like the things in my life. I like what I'm doing. But don't prune it. God says, no, no. If you're not faithful in the little, if you're not going to let me take care of you while things are little, then you're never going to see the much. I personally think that the reason why a lot of churches stay small is because they have a small mentality. And the reason your witness does not expand is because you've got a small mentality. I want to ask the praise team to come back up. We're going to actually come to the altar once more. Should have told you that at the very beginning so you knew what the Holy Ghost was still going to do. If your life is not in right alignment with Christ's desires, then everything in your life is going to grow out of alignment. Let me say that again. If your life is not in right alignment with Christ's desires, then everything, no matter what you invest in, will continue to grow out of alignment. If what you are pursuing in life does not seek to bring the Father glory, it's going to cause two problems. Number one, your fruit's not going to be good. It's not going to bring God glory. And number two, you are only disconnecting yourself from the true vine. The more you pursue your own means, your own endeavors, the more you pursue your own comforts, the more you're just disconnecting from what God wants to do in your life. Now, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying God doesn't meet dreams and goals and visions. Don't, I'm talking about if it's not in right alignment with God. It's just leading you away from God. Please get that. Anything not in right alignment with God is aimed to take you away from God. So more of it, fixing it, doesn't change you. You need to go to the root. This past uh, couple of weeks, I've been in some books. My vacation time, I enjoy to read some books that I can't always have time to read. One of the books, well, each one of them are about the second half of life, okay? I'm 50. I'm not as young as I once was, but I ain't done, all right? So as I'm reading this, one of the books I'm reading is called Second Wind for the Second Half. Another one is a book uh, called Breakfast with Fred, talking with our young men about 
reading mentors, those who can invest in you. This guy hits on it too. And then the third book, well, it doesn't matter what the title of the book is. But every, all three of these authors hit on this very issue, that it talks about finishing well. They covered eight different areas. All three of these authors, written at different time periods, cover eight areas in each of our lives that if there's a problem with your root system, then everything else is, like if you don't take care of it at the root, it's all going to go in the wrong direction. It's not going to accomplish what you wanted it to do. Your relationship with God. Number two is your relationship with your spouse. Your relationship with your children and your grandchildren. Your friendships. Your finances. Your health, which includes leisure, exercise, your appetite, and your rest. The seventh was your work life. And the eighth is your personal calling in ministry. You need to give attention at the root to your personal call. I want to ask you to stand with me all over this house. And at the bidding of the Holy Ghost, I'm asking you, to return to an old path. It's not an old place, it's an old path. It's the path of prayer. And I'm asking you to join me here in the front in this altar area, find you a place, and go to the root. I know I just flew right through those different eight, eight different areas, but I know the Holy Ghost is already addressing some of you on some of that already. Some things you're wishing you could change well, your wish isn't going to change it. Some of you got a plan to make a change. Guess what? You may be able to follow your plan, but it's just going to make you of the more, more the person of the problem you are. It's time to just dedicate it to the Lord. It's time to sacrifice it to the Lord. Father, I pray right now that God, as the, these altars open, they become the stairway, the gateway into the throne room of heaven to come deeper. Dig deeper. We want to go to the root. Anything out of alignment with God through prayer can be placed in right alignment. Doesn't mean we're necessarily doing it wrong, but it doesn't have the right root. Jesus Speak in this place by your spirit. In the name of Jesus, I pray.